Okay, welcome back to this uh, video, and we are continuing our responses to Phelan McPhelan. In this video, uh, he has made the claim that in order for the kingdom and Christ to come, there has to be a mass conversion of Jews, and that the reason that the kingdom was postponed is because the Jews rejected him, that is, the national kingdom of Israel rejected him in the first century, so everything got kind of shifted around, moved around in the eschatological uh, scheme of things, and did not occur, even though the statements say that these things were at hand shortly to come to pass, coming in a very little while, etc. So uh, that's his viewpoint. Now, he is kind of, um, uh, I would say, not the classical um, historical premillennialist, but he is, uh, he's kind of a hybrid, he says, on some things. And so maybe that will come out in some of the views that he has. Nevertheless, uh, his basic claim is that the uh, coming of Christ could not occur and cannot occur until there is a mass conversion of Jews at some time in our future. So let's go ahead and talk about this. Now, I'll be covering this in several uh, videos because there are other arguments that he makes, and I don't want to make uh, the videos too long, so we're going to just take them kind of uh, one at a time in terms of the major points. Now, let's go ahead, first of all, and look at uh, one text that has a bearing on this, and then we'll uh, proceed with some others along the way. So what we're going to do is uh, share our screen again. And in this one, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 3. And this is the time when John the Baptist comes, and uh, he's baptizing, you know, in the Jordan. And, you know, many people are coming out from that region to be baptized of him. Uh, his message is, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. And people are responding to that message. But the scripture says, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? So he's asking them, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? And then he tells them, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. So he's speaking to these Jews and telling them that they need to bear fruits of repentance. And then he also tells them, do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Now, does that sound like God would postpone his eschatological program when he could raise up stones to uh, Israel, to be his children, to, to be sons of Abraham? That's almost like what he told Moses in the wilderness when Israel had committed sin with the golden calf. And God tells him, look, Moses, step aside. I'm going to, you know, destroy this nation of people, and then I will raise up another one for you to lead on into the promised land. Of course, Moses interceded, and God did not do that. But he was letting him know, this is what I can do. So my actions of fulfilling my promise have nothing to do with whether people obey me or not. And from that point, notice what he says further. And even now. The axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit, notice, is cut down and thrown into the fire. Does that sound like he was waiting for a mass conversion of them? He says if they don't obey, if they don't repent, it's cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The fire was the fire of judgment that took place in 70 AD. And by the way, that was the coming of Christ. So their refusal to obey did not prevent or preclude the coming of Christ. Notice again in verse 12, his winnowing fan is in his hand. Why does he have that? That's for harvesting. That's for separating the wheat from the chaff. There would be nothing to separate if they were going to convert in a mass conversion to the Lord. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, another parable that is similar to that is the parable of the tares and wheat in Matthew chapter 13. 
But let's look at the parable originally and see uh, something that is said concerning it. In verse 24, it says, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain has sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came in and said to him, Sir, do you not, or did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together. Now watch this until the harvest. He didn't say let them grow together at some point before the harvest. He said, let them grow together until the harvest. Or rather, he didn't say, uh, let them um, stay in the field and then at the harvest, you know, go and try to convert them. But no, he says, let them grow together until the harvest. They are in the field with the good seed growing all alone. Let them grow until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first, gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So when you look at the fulfillment of the parable and see, starting in, let's say, about verse 39, it says, you know, the enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. That would be the end of the age of Moses, just like in Matthew 24, 3, that's associated with the destruction of the temple. And the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares or the messengers, the, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. Now, Jesus says at the end of the age, there are going to be tares burned. There was not a mass conversion that took place before the return of Christ. Notice again, this is at the return of Christ because he says the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And by the way, that is a quote from Daniel chapter 12 and uh, verses 1 through 3, where it talks about many who slept in the dust of the earth at the time of the great tribulation, etc. He says, would awake some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and contempt. And those who turn uh, many to righteousness, of course, would uh, be as a, uh, a light, as the stars of the heavens. Now, so from that perspective, you can see there are two cases that mention the coming of Christ. This is the time of the coming of the kingdom, so that's an eschatological text. But yet, they grew together until that time, which was the end of the age of Moses, and then, of course, that is the time when the harvest took place and the tares were cast out. Now, you have a similar text to that in Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. In Matthew 8, when Jesus speaks to the centurion, he tells them, and I say to you, many will come from the east and west and sit down. Now, that's the gathering, what he says from the east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That's resurrection into the kingdom of heaven. But what happens at that time? Not a national conversion, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, Luke also has a... Um, Parallel to this text in Luke chapter 13, and the verses begin at around verse, uh, let's see, 25, when he says, when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you began to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, now he's talking to national Israel at the time, and he says, you began to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us, and he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. Who could that be other than national Israel? We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. These are not modern-day streets for the year 2024. 
this is not happening in the 21st century. This happened in the first century when Jesus was there with them. As he said in uh, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 17, O faithless generation, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I bear with you? How long am I going to be hanging out with you? That's the generation in which he was living. And so he says, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Doesn't sound like a mass conversion. Sounds like that's when they are cast out. As he said, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. They will uh, thrust out. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south. That's the gathering from the four winds spoken of in Matthew 24 and verse 31. And they will sit down in the kingdom of God. That's the time of resurrection. And that is the time of the coming of the eschatological kingdom in its consummation. As 2 Timothy 4 and 1 says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Now, when we go to the 21st chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, and the verse is 43, this is in the parable of the vine dresser. And when they send out, the servants, and it, well, first the father leases out his vineyard, and then uh, he sends his servants out to, you know, gather benefits of the fruit, and they treat them spitefully, and eventually uh, they kill some, and then finally he says, I'm going to send to them my son, and uh, perhaps they will, you know, respect and honor him. But when they see the son, you know, what they say at that point is, this is the son, he's the heir let us kill him that we can seize his kingdom and take his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Notice, they rejected the cornerstone. Therefore, now watch to see if he postpones anything at their rejection. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you. He didn't say given to you because you rejected it. He says the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomsoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now that's just like the text in Galatians chapter four and the verse is 30 when the Bible says Abraham had two sons. Now let's look at these two sons in Galatians chapter four. He says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written, Abraham had two sons, the one by a bond woman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. That's national Israel. And he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants. That's the old covenant and the new covenant. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage. That's national Israel, which is Hagar. Well, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is. That was the Jerusalem in the time of the first century, in the time of Christ and Paul, and is in bondage with her children. But the children, uh, the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. That refers to the new covenant church. Now, he tells them uh, because of their persecuting, as he says in verse 29, now, as he was, or uh, he says, but as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, that is, with Ishmael and Isaac in the historical situation, he says, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So national Israel was not going to inherit with the kingdom of God or with the sons of the kingdom because they rejected the kingdom, and therefore God was not going to allow them to experience the salvation. The last text that I would like to look at is found in Luke chapter 19, and this is a parable of the um, a parable of the ten minions. And of course, in this one, 
it says, you know, this was spoken because some thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. And that doesn't mean that it didn't come in the first century. It just would not appear immediately at the time that they were expecting. But he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minions and said to uh, them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Well, he was reigning over the rest, but they said, we're not going to accept his reign. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money. Now, it didn't say he came back to receive the kingdom. It says he returned having received the kingdom. He then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how every man gained with, with trading. And so once he uh, took assessment of all of them with the one who uh, took his money and um, did not deposit it uh, and, and uh, left it wrapped in a handkerchief, he says, you know, why did you put it in the bank? That at my coming, I could have collected with interest. And from this point, he says, bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and say uh, or slay them before me. So you can see that it, the conduct of the people who rejected him had nothing to do with whether or not the kingdom came. It came in spite of their rejection. Well, that's all we're going to say in this video. We've got some more points to bring on this particular uh, objection and um, concern and point. So we'll be back in the next video. In the meantime, be sure and subscribe if you have not already done that. And if this is your first time coming to the channel, be sure and click on the bell so you get a notification every time we upload a new video. In addition to that, we want to encourage you to uh, subscribe to our newsletter, which is absolutely free. You can unsubscribe at any time and we'll send you a video or lesson written or otherwise, maybe an audio every single week. And all you have to do is subscribe and they'll start coming into your uh, mailbox. Be sure to confirm your subscription as well by checking in your email once you do that um, that subscription. In addition, we um, uh, and you can do that by going to allthingsfulfilled.com forward slash subscribe. Uh, finally, we encourage you to go to our website for additional uh, teaching and information that can help you in your studies of eschatology. Until next time, this is William Bale saying you have a great day and we'll see you in the next video.